This morning we're going to begin a two-part series entitled Making the Most Out of Your Day. But before I go into this, I do want to thank everyone for all their prayers. I received some wonderful, encouraging thoughts by way of email, text messages, Facebook, phone calls. And I just say thank you to each and every one. It's not been a good 2015 for me, so I'm looking forward to 2016. And by the way, I want you to know this really was, I believe, part of God's plan. And I'll share why. When finally, on Friday, my wife convinced me to go to urgent care. We went in, they did some tests, and uh, when she came back in, she said, I'm sending you right to the hospital. And I go, well, no, I really don't want to go to the hospital in London. Why don't you give me enough medication so I can get home to Plattsburgh and I'll go to the hospital there? And she said, you'll not make it. So I go, okay, send me to the hospital. <laughs> I take option one, and if option two is on the plate. So that's why I ended up in the hospital. It uh, was an infection that, that took care of my bladder, my uh, prostate, urinary tract, and some of it may have gone septic. So they got me right to the hospital and began to treat me. But uh, this week I was at a minister's meeting, and the, the pastors were talking and saying, man, Norm, you had a terrible 2015. I'm thankful for anything. I said, oh, yeah. I'm five feet, seven inches still above ground. <laughs> 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 there's, a, there's a lot to be thankful for. So we're going to be looking at how to make the most out of your day. And uh, before I get to the message in Scripture, I want you to know that I enjoy golfing, but I'm an average golfer at best. But during the summer months, and a lot of times in the early fall, I'll go out with some of the guys in the church, and the, there was one particular incident where I went out with three of the other guys, and I got up and I drove my ball 300 yards down the middle of the fairway. That doesn't happen often. I shot even those in my company. <laughs> but to make things even better, by the time we got to my ball, it had rolled up onto an ant hill. So it was already teed up. <laughs> already for the next shot. I'm like, Lord, this is wonderful. In two shots, I can be on the green. So I approached the ball. I took a swat at the ball, knocked out about a third of the ant hill. Never touched my ball. <laughs> now, my way of thinking, that was a practice swing. I didn't touch the ball. Everything's good. So I got up again, I approached the ball, I took the swing, and another third of the ant pile was decapitated. <laughs> Ants, dirt everywhere, but the ball never moved. <laughs> Just another practice swing. The third time I approached the ball, this ant comes crawling up to the top of my ball and yells out to all his comrades, if you want to survive, get on the ball. <laughs> this thing we call life, you can get on the ball. And I want to share with you how you can be very busy and still be on the ball and still be honoring God. But there is a secret to all the madness. If you take a look at our scripture text from Mark 1, verses 16 through 39, it reads like this. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place and prayed. Later, Simon and the others were not to find him. And when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, You must go on to other towns as well, and I'll preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. I'm going to share a little bit about what's happening here as the disciples are finding Jesus and why Jesus said we need to go into other towns. But before I do, how many have seen the TV series 24? Okay, a lot of hands have gone up. Some of you may really like that series. But if you watch, it seems like Jack Bauer always has his hands full, doesn't he? Trying to save the United States from something. A terrorist attack, a nuclear attack. Something he's always trying to do. And I'm told that if you watch the show, it's packed with nail-biting action. But I want you to know this morning, you don't have to be a Jack Power to be busy. You don't have to be a Jack Power to feel like your day is always packed with nail writing action. How many of you today can say you lead a busy life? Okay, a few of you. A few of you. Sometimes 
just looking at your schedule can tire you out. Monday is basketball practice, Tuesday is dance rehearsal, Wednesday is Bible study or some club that you're a part of, Thursday is meetings or perhaps other organizational plans that you have or maybe karate practice, Friday and Saturday are game days, Sunday is church, and after that, this time of year, you try to get in some Christmas shopping in the afternoon, come back, stop the kids from killing each other, or maybe do their homework before Monday hits, and you have two hours to yourself before you go to bed, and it all starts over again. And during the Advent season, our schedules even get more hectic, don't they? With all the Christmas celebrations and other activities that we've committed ourselves to. And unfortunately, our society actually makes us feel guilty if we're not always on the run. If you meet somebody in town at the grocery store and you ask them how they're doing, almost inevitably, they're going to tell you how busy their day is. Isn't that true? <coughs> and they're going to rattle off a great list of things that they have to do, activities they need to attend, or appointments they're still up and coming. Americans are busier than ever. For example, dinner time. Some of you in this place remember when dinner time was a time when the family all came together, five o'clock, six o'clock, sat at a table and enjoyed a meal, a home-cooked meal together. Today, when dinner time comes, mom is texting all the family members throughout the house letting them know it's time for dinner. <laughs> They're running down the stairs with their coats on, ready to go to the minivan for fast food. And if that's not bad enough, we're often eating our meals or doing other things like working and driving or watching television. We don't eat, we eat brains, truthfully. <laughs> I don't even want to tell you about my schedule. My wife will tell you a lot of times I'm eating standing up. I'm walking around thinking what I need to do next while I'm trying to eat my food. It's because of this, because my life needs it, and I believe your life needs it, I chose to do a two-part series on how to make the most out of your day. And because we're in the Advent season, where the busy dial seems to be way over on work speed, you sometimes can't even fathom about slowing down or relaxing. There are just too many things to do, too many things to get done. So let me pose another question. How many would really like to slow down? Ah, I'm with you there. In fact, a recent CNN poll shared that 59% of Americans answered that very same question by saying, yes, I wish I could slow down. But the other question caught my attention. I wish I could cope better with the busyness of life. And that's what I thought was important. It's not just slowing down. It's coping with everything that's happening all around us. And that brings us back to the first chapter of Mark. Jesus, in this chapter, is incredibly busy. In fact, all through the book of Mark, we get the impression that everyone's in a hurry. Mark uses the word immediately 50 times in his gospel. Jesus was baptized, and immediately the Holy Spirit sent him into the desert. Jesus invites Simon and Andrew to be his disciples, and immediately they left their nets and joined Christ. Jesus heals people, and immediately the news spreads all through the town. It's a fast-paced book, yet in today's portion of Jesus' 24-hour day, he shows us how we can cope with the frantic pace that life offers. And it happens, my friends, right after the most hectic day in the life of Christ. If you were to read Mark chapter 1, here's what we've discovered. He preaches all morning long. This is Jesus. In the afternoon, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. That's interesting. <coughs> he heals Peter's mother-in-law. But well, we won't even go down that road. And just when it looks like he can kick back and relax, someone comes to the house and says, Lord, I saw that you did in church this morning for that possessed demon man. Can you help my kid? Well, that's a good one, isn't it? Hey, Lord, I saw you did that child and you help my kids. They need some help. And then someone else comes over and says, Lord, is it true that you can heal disease 
Jesus, because my wife's been sick for a long time. Can you help her? And by the time we get to verse 32, the whole town is gathering outside the place where Jesus is standing. And it says that because he loved them, he healed everyone he had touched. But the more he healed, the more people showed up. And his healing took them way into the evening hours. So from early morning preaching, to healing, to meeting needs, all the way to the evening hours, Jesus was busy. And I'm sure you can think like I do, that by the time the day was over, and Jesus crawled into bed, and his head hit the pillow, and he's right off the light. And the disciples knew that because of this day, he more than likely would be sleeping in the next morning. He deserved to sleep in the next morning. So they went to find him, and he was nowhere to be found. They searched the house, they couldn't find him. They searched the neighborhood, they couldn't find him. And finally, one of the disciples who finally found him, found him doing what? Praying. Jesus was praying. Jesus recognized a need in his own fast-paced life to retreat to a quiet, lonely place for reflection, meditation, and communion with God. Which we're going to be discovering over the last, the next two weeks, rather, that's what you and I have to do as well. We need to be people of prayer. And it's key to understand that, you know what? If you think about the life of Jesus, he was one of the most productive men in all of history. In the three years in which he walked the face of this earth in a ministry form, he did more in mankind than you and I could ever do in a lifetime. How did he do it? The answer is found in Mark 35, or at verse 35, chapter 1. Early the next morning, while it was still dark, Jesus woke and left the house. He went to a lonely place where he prayed. Let me give you an acronym. For the life of Jesus, I call it deep. A life empowered around prayer. When you and I begin to adapt the habit of prayer in our lives, we'll discover that only we'll be able to accomplish more and do more than ever we thought possible. But alongside of that, by the end of the day, we'll not be as frustrated or exhausted as we usually are because we didn't bring God into the picture. The benefits of a life saturated with prayer are incredible. Prayer releases us from the anxiety of our own agenda. You know, I, I'm just going to pause here for a moment because in the pastor's role, and especially the way I'm wired, I like everything just kind of fall in line. I schedule my days, I schedule my weeks, I plan everything out in detail, and in the end, God messes it up. <laughs> and on purpose. Because God wants to be sure that I'm flexible, that I'm usable, that I'll listen to Him, that He can speak to me, and my plans go out the window if God says so. And then, early ministry, that was a struggle for me. Because I'm organized. So it releases me from that whole agenda. And I try to learn the best way to plan is with a pencil, with a good eraser. <laughs> Prayer brings clarity and purpose to my daily activities. The more I pray, the more I understand the heartbeat of God. You know, a verse I put on Facebook here a couple of days ago says, let myself in the Lord, and he will give thee the desires of thy heart. The real interpretation of that is to let yourself in the Lord, and he'll place within your heart the right desires. And so if we give ourselves to the Lord, He's going to bring clarity and purpose to our days and to our activities. Prayer gives me the assurance to say yes to some things and gives me the guidance to say no to other things. How many of you here today, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you here today, just think about it, are overloaded with tasks and responsibilities because you just can't say no? You want to please everybody. So what happens is you go ahead and just confirm whatever plans they have for you. Well, if you get inside God, He's going to help you understand that there must be boundaries. 
There are things you can do and things that you can't do. Prayer makes it possible to live a productive, meaningful life without killing ourselves in the process. E.M. Bouts, the great prayer warrior of the 20th century, once said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but people whom the Holy Spirit can use, people of prayer, people mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through method, but through people. He does not come on machinery, but on people. He does not anoint plans, but men and women of prayer. So if you and I want to have the kind of impact in our lives that some of the great men and women of the Bible had, then we need to understand the secret of getting before God and praying. From Abraham to Noah, from Moses to Joseph, Elijah, David, Daniel, all of them had this one thing in common. They learned that there was power in consistent, persistent prayer. And over the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at four great benefits that Jesus shares in this prayer for this moment where he pulled aside to pray in Mark chapter 1. As busy you might think you are, I guarantee you, you're never get things done that you could get done if you only pause to pray. The first is prayer is empowering. And I'm only going to share the first thing this morning. The next week we're going to share next week. And at the conclusion, I'll let you know what they are. But if you're wondering why you don't sense the power of God in your life like you ought or like you should, it probably can be traced back to where are you or where are you not in your prayer life. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus is a great king we like to sing. But part of the things is, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because what? We do not carry everything to God in prayer. Jesus realized that without God's power, he too would be inefficient. So he went to that quiet and solitary place in order to recharge his spiritual batteries. If you read John 5, 19, Jesus says this, I assure you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Did you catch that? Jesus says, apart from the Father, I can't do anything. And so we have a prayer life, a connection where he always was feeling and sending the heartbeat of God. But later, in John 15, 5, Jesus says that you and I, on our own, cannot do anything either. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If any remain in me, and I remain in them, they produce much fruit. But without me, they can do nothing. So if we don't guard our prayer life, we will become, I will become, spiritually anemic. And as I've already mentioned, this is an area I have to constantly focus on, because my rhetoric is, pausing for a moment is the wrong thing to do. I have to be on the go, I have to have something to do. And so the Lord is teaching me, you might put me in the hospital if he has to, that there needs to be slowing down. And the reason I mentioned that going to the hospital, I believe, was a God thing. If this happened while I was in Haiti, I wouldn't be coming home. In fact, uh, there might be a funeral that would be taking place. I never would have made it to a hospital that was close enough to treat the ailment. So God just said, we're going to take care of this so that there's not going to be these other issues. And so you also know the congregation, due to medical advice and the advice of my wife, uh, I will not be going to Haiti uh, this particular winter. And uh, we've taken that off the plate because of the medical situations that's going on. But the Lord says, you can't do anything unless you are in connection with me. And how does that happen? It happens through prayer. It happens through a time when we just connect in a way with God when he speaks into our heart. Let me try to put it this way. It's a horrible analogy, but I'm going to go down this road anyway. Suppose there's a project that you have to do, and an electric power-driven drill would get that job done in a, in a jiffy. But you also have a screwdriver, which would take a lot more time, a lot more energy. But you have a choice. You want to use the drill or the screwdriver? 
Or you're mixing up a great big batter for some kind of occasion, and you have a wonderful mixer, top of the line mixer, or you have a spoon. <coughs> and you have to kind of work really hard and really long. Or your house needs cleaning, and uh, you have carpet, you have you know wood floors, but you have a vacuum cleaner. Maybe it's one of those bison animal ones. But you have also a broom. And finally, you're in a hot, humid place. You are miserable because of the sweat coming off your brow. Would you like an air conditioner or just simply a hand fan? What I'm saying is that when it comes to the electrical power tools, they really outweigh, pretty much outweigh, the human power tools. You really can't compare them. But then why is it when it comes to choosing God's power over our own power, we do the silly thing and choose to do or live on or do life through the human power? We train the wisdom, the guidance, the comfort, the insights, the peace, the strength that God gives for our own weak hand-powered tools. By neglecting to spend time with our Heavenly Father, we're in effect saying something like this. Well, you know, excuse me, God. I think I can go this alone today. I'm not going to be needing you. In fact, I don't need you at this very moment, so thanks, but no thanks. Wouldn't it be a foolish thing to do? When can we operate without God? When can we function without Him? I'm going to ask the praise team if they come back to the platform at this time. But a good rule of thumb is this. The greater the stress, the greater the pressure in your life, the more you need to spend time with God. And on the back of your insert, you will notice a place to chart. And I just want to quickly go over that chart. Because it talks about the difference between a person who just says they pray but really are not engaged in prayer to a person who has the habit, the devotion of prayer. One prays at his or her convenience. The other prays at God's command. One prays when there are problems. The other prays when there are opportunities, as well as problems. One has guilt knowing that he or she should pray more. The other has joy and wants to pray more. One asks God to bless what he or she is doing. The other asks God to enable him or her to do what God is blessing. One feels too busy to pray, the other knows that he or she is too busy not to pray. And one uses God where the other is used by God. You see the, the difference? You and I need to be prayer warriors. We need to develop the discipline of prayer. Next week we'll be talking about prayer is enlightening, prayer is encouraging, and prayer is emboldening. And the reason I chose this series is because we're moving into the Advent season and we're all busy. How can we cope with the busyness? By allowing God to give wisdom and direction. Let's stand together.